Welcome to Management 3120, Chapter 2 Lecture. This lecture is based on material taken from the textbook Principles of Operations Management, Sustainability and Supply Chain Management, 10th edition, by Heiser, Rendner, and Munson. So let's get started. First, we'll go over the chapter's learning objectives. We're going to define mission and strategy. We're going to identify and explain three strategic approaches to competitive advantage. Then we're going to understand the significant key success factors and core competencies. And we're going to use factor rating to evaluate both country and provider outsources. And we're going to identify and explain four global operations strategy operate options. So today's successful operations manager has a global view of operations strategy. Since the early 1990s, nearly 3 billion people in developing countries have overcome the cultural, religious, ethnic, and political barriers that constrain productivity. And now, they're all players on the global stage. As these barriers disappear, simultaneous advances are being made in technology. Um, also in reliability, um, as far as when it comes down to shipping, um, and expensive uh, communication. So these changes mean that increasingly firms find their customers and suppliers located around the world. The unsurprising result is illustrated here, right here on this slide in figure 2.1. This illustrates the steady growth of world trade over time. Now this means increasing economic integration and interdependence of countries in a world, uh, in a world um, of globalization. So in a, um, so essentially like globalization is now the new trend. Um, it's the, uh, essentially the uh, consequence of an integration of interdependence countries. So when you hear globalization, that's exactly what we're referring to is the integration and interdependence of countries in the market. So in response, uh, organizations are hastily extending their distribution channels and supply chains globally. Now this uh, results in innovative strategies where firms compete not just within their own expertise, but with the talent in their entire global supply chain. So globalization means customers, talent, and suppliers are worldwide. So the new standards of global competitiveness impact quality, variety, customization, convenience, timeliness, and cost. Globalization strategies contribute efficiency uh, to efficiency, uh, adding uh, value to products and services, but also complicate the operations manager's job. Um, now, complexity, risk, and competition are intensified, uh, forcing companies to adjust for a shrinking world. The textbook identifies six reasons domestic business operations decide to change to uh, some uh, to form uh, international operations. So they are listed on uh, this slide. So number one is to improve the supply chain. Number two is to reduce costs and exchange rate. Three is to improve operations. Four is to understand markets. Five is to improve products. And six is to attract and retain global talent. I'm just going to leave these up here for a little bit for you uh, note takers. So the supply chain can often be improved by locating facilities in countries where unique resources are available. These resources may be human resource expertise, low cost labor, or raw material. Uh, for example, auto styling studios throughout the world have migrated to the auto mecca of Southern California to ensure 
the necessary expertise in contemporary auto design. Uh, you know, similarly, world athletic shoe production has migrated from South Korea to China. Uh, this location takes advantage of the low cost labor and production competence in a city where uh, 40,000 people work uh, making athletic shoes for the world. Um, and also, too, like think about perfume manufacturers uh, and their uh, presence in France, you know, where much of the world's perfumes, uh, es you know, essences are prepared from the flowers of the Mediterranean. So it's all unique to those particular areas. So locating facilities closer to the unique resources is essential for certain markets, as I just mentioned. Now, many international operations seek to reduce risks associated with the changing currency values or exchange rates, as well as take advantage of the tangible opportunities to reduce their costs. Less stringent government regulations on a wide variety of operation practices, such as environmental control, health, and safety, can also reduce indirect costs. So as we stated earlier, uh, low labor costs is often, but not always, the primary draw as firms sometimes locate to areas containing particular expertise in whatever they are producing, as in our California auto uh, example. A very common reason to globalize is to reduce costs, especially labor costs or tariff costs. Now, the numbers can be hard to ignore. So, for example, uh, saving $10 per hour per worker with a 40-hour work week um, at 52 weeks per year and 1,000 workers represents a savings in excess of $20 million annually. So it's something to consider. Um, the agreements and organizations identified here on this slide represent ways in which firms can receive preferential uh, tariff treatment. I want to leave this up for you note takers. Okay, not all great ideas come from one place. Uh, internationalization provides access to great ideas from around the world. Um, you know, plus locating overseas can provide better and quicker service to customers located in those countries. Um, operations, uh, you know, operations managers learn from better understanding of management innovations in different countries. Uh, for instance, the Japanese have improved inventory management. The Germans have, are aggressively using robots. And the Scandinavians have contributed to improved um, ergonomics throughout the world. Now, international firms inevitably learn uh, about opportunities for new products and services. Also, they may be able to sell maturing products longer in less developed countries. Now, because international operations require interaction with foreign customers, suppliers, and other competitive businesses, international firms learn about opportunities for new products and services. Europe led the way with cell phone innovations. And then the Japanese and Indians led with cell phone fads. Uh, knowledge of markets not only helps firms understand where the market is going, but also helps firms um, diversify their customer base, add production flexibility, and smooth the business cycle. So firms can benefit from teaming up with a foreign partner to learn from each other and develop products and processes based on a unique knowledge of both firms. Therefore, learning does not take place in isolation. So firms uh, serve themselves and their customers when they remain open to the free flow of ideas. For example, Toyota and BMW will manage joint research and share development costs 
on battery research for the next generation of green cars. Uh, their relationship also provides Toyota with BMW's highly regarded diesel engines for its European market, where diesel power uh, vehicles make up more than half the market. And the payoff is the reduced risk in battery development for both organizations, a state-of-the-art uh, diesel engine for Toyota in Europe, and low per unit diesel engine costs for BMW. Similarly, international learning in operations has taken place in South Korea's Samsung and Germany's Robert Bosch, uh, you know, joined the, uh, to produce lithium batteries to benefit both organizations. So you can see, and I've mentioned it before, where organizations are starting to uh, partner with people who would even be uh, perceived as, uh, you know, uh, competition within their respective market. And a lot of it is has to do with um, social responsibility, these green initiatives. Um, also, too, it's, it's healthier for the market, um, you know, that there is a little bit of uh, competition. And in today's uh, turbulent environment, when I say turbulent, you know, things are now more complex. Um, you know, the uh, technological advancements are moving at such a high rate that uh, aligning with the competition uh, can be healthy. And we're starting to see more of it. So great employers are attracted to firms that offer more worldwide employment opportunities as well as a better insulation from unemployment. Uh, global organizations can attract and retain better employees by offering more employment opportunities. Now the need of uh, people in all functional areas uh, and areas of expertise uh, worldwide has increased. Uh, global firms can recruit and retain good employees because they provide both greater growth opportunities and insulation against the underemployment uh, under uh, during times of economic downturn. So during economic downturns in one country or continent, a global firm has the means to relocate non-essential personnel to more posture, uh, prosperous, prosperous uh, locations. So um, just to uh, recap, successfully achieving a competitive advantage in our shrinking world means maximizing all other possible opportunities from tangible to intangible that international operations can offer. So whereas there are great forces driving firms toward globalization, many ch challenges remain. One of these challenges is reconciling differences in social and cultural behavior. Now with issues ranging from bribery to child labor issues to uh, the environment, uh, managers sometimes do not know how to respond when operating in a different culture. What one country's culture deems acceptable may be considered unacceptable or illegal in another. It is not by chance that there are a fewer female managers in the Middle East than in India, for example, um, or even here in the U.S. Now, in the last decade, uh, changes to international laws, agreements, and codes of conduct have been applied to define ethical uh, behavior among managers around the world. The World Trade Organization, WTO, for example, helps make uniform uh, the protection of both governments and in industries from foreign firms that engage in unethical conduct. So even on issues where significant differences between cultures exist, as an area of bribery or protection of intellectual property, global uniformity is slowly being accepted by most nations. Uh, now, despite cultural and ethical differences, we live in a period of extraordinary uh, mobility of capital, uh, information, goods, and even people. So we can expect this to continue. The financial sector, the telecommunications sector, and the logistics infrastructure of the world are healthy institutions that foster efficient and effective use of capital information and goods. So globalization with all its opportunities and risk is here. Um, it's here to stay. 
it must be embraced as managers develop their missions and strategies. And this slide lists many of the factors that may uh, have been uh, may be considered in global location decisions. So national literacy rate, uh, rate of innovation, that's very important. Is the rate of where you're looking at consistent with the rate of where you need to be? The turbulence of change we're uh, you know we're fostering here. Um, will your products keep up with the market? rate of technology change, uh, are you going to be able to engage in effective change management um, at the rate, uh, number of skilled workers, you know, are they there to help sustain uh, your operations, political stability, uh, you know, is your product or your operations or even your company brand consistent with the value system of the uh, country you're looking to relocate to or uh, set up shop in, uh, product liability laws, um, Export restrictions, that's pretty important. Uh, once your product is developed, are you going to be able to export it? Uh, variations in language, you know, there are going to be uh, operational um, and strategic impediments because of uh, the lack of communication. Uh, work ethics, are they the same? Um, here in the United States, you know, uh, we've uh, developed and we developed our infrastructures based on at least a 40 hour work week. You know, um, can you bet on that, you know, in your next location? Uh, tax rates, inflation, availability of raw materials, interest rates, population, transportation infrastructure, and communication system. These are all important. And this slide uh, illustrates parent companies in home countries of certain products. Some of these you may not even realize. I'm just going to leave this slide up here so you can take it in. And this slide is a continuation of the list. And an organization's mission is its purpose. What will be, uh, what will contribute to society? Um, its strategy is more specific. It represents an action plan to achieve the mission. So the mission is where the organization is going and the strategy is how it's going to get there. You're going to want to remember these two definitions. Leave this on there for you uh, note takers. Now economic success, indeed survival, is the result of identifying missions to satisfy a customer's needs and wants. We define the organization's mission as its purpose, what it will contribute to society. Uh, mission statements provide boundaries and focus for organizations and the concept around which the firm can rally. The mission states their rationale for the organization's existence. And this slide uh, represents an example of the corporate mission statement for Merck. Um, notice the focus on quality, innovation, uh, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and stakeholders all wrapped up in one. Uh, there is an interconnection with the 10 strategic operations management decisions that we covered in chapter one, right? To each of these. Uh, notice how the statement is all encompassing. And the mission statement reads fluently. However, it is all encompassing of deliberate approaches to successful operations management. Each one of these is kind of a facet of a uh, focus you want to take. And the same goes here for Pepsi Company's mission statement. Pepsi has a quality focus, uh, customer focus, stakeholder focus, employee focus, and an integration of its core values in its mission statement. The integration of a value system in a mission statement is an effective way of shaping behavior in the organization to operate ethically, kind of foster ethical decision making. Um, however, it needs to go beyond the mission statement. So organizations need to socialize this mission statement 
uh, or their mission, mission statements and value systems. So employees identify with the purpose. And finally, this example represents Arnold Palmer Hospital. Again, look at the concentration on values and quality. Everything is oriented around the patient, which would be their customer. And as I pointed out in the previous slides in which we were referencing the three sample mission statements, this slide suggests uh, that several more considerations than profit maximizing play a role in shaping a firm's mission. So we're going to go over this. In a mission, you're going to find philosophy and values, uh, profitability and growth, environment, customers, public image, and the benefit to society. Whereas most organizations do wish to turn a profit, and there's nothing wrong with that, organizations need to be careful when prioritizing profits as a driving force. It may result in ethical issues wherein employees are looking to meet financial goals at all costs. Um, encompassing profits in a mission statement should be accompanied with an integration of core values. Now, including the environment may not only keep the organization green and out of trouble, but also motivate customers who are strong in social responsibility, especially within the environmental focus. Um, transparency of a mission or organizational purpose integrated with an environmental focus or social responsibility is also building an internal marketing effort when considering customers sharing their values. And incorporating customers into the mission is never a bad move, um, especially since customer needs must be considered if an organization is to sustain in a competitive market. And public image and benefits to society correspond with what I said earlier about the integration of values and social responsibility. An organization's mission statement can essentially be a branding uh, tool in itself. So functional areas have their own milestones and strategies, which usually are based on higher level missions and strategies in the organization. Once an organization's mission has been decided, each functional area within the firm determines its supporting missions. Uh, taking you back into your intro to management course, by functional area, I mean the major disciplines required by the firm, such as marketing, finance and accounting, and production slash operations. So missions for each function are developed to support the firm's overall mission. Then within that function, Lower level supporting missions are established for the operations management function. Now the next uh, few slides um, represent sample missions for a company, uh, the operations function and major operations management departments. So you have the sample uh, company mission to manufacture and service an innovative, growing and profitable worldwide microwave uh, communications business that exceeds our customers' expectations. Again, it's all-encompassing. Uh, all Sample operations uh, management uh, mission here is to produce products consistent with the company's mission as the worldwide low-cost manufacturer. Here, this one here is concentrating on low cost as it is its approach. Not as robust as the previous one, it's not as all-encompassing, but it certainly gets its purpose out there. And this slide illustrates the integration of operations management department's missions into the organizational mission. So you have product design. As said, our mission is to design and produce products and services with uh, outstanding quality and inherent customer value. Um, again, they're concentrating on quality and the customer. Uh, quality management to attain the exceptional value that is consistent with our company mission and marketing objectives by close attention to design, procurement, uh, production, and field service operations. Now, that is very consistent with what a quality management focus would be. Process design. Uh, to determine design and produce the production process 
uh, and equipment that will be compatible with low-cost product, high quality, and good quality of work life at economical costs. And continuing with the operations management department missions, here we have location to locate, design, and build efficient and economical facilities that will yield high value to the company, its employees, and the community. So do you see how this one corresponds when we were talking about outsourcing and going global? Um, how that can incorporate uh, or there could be an integration of that because the, the focus is in fact to be efficient. Uh, layout design to achieve uh, through skill imagination and resourcefulness in layout and work methods, production effectiveness and efficiency while supporting a high quality of work life. And then finally we have human resources on this slide uh, to provide a good quality of work life with well-designed, safe, rewarding jobs, uh, stable employment, and equitable pay in exchange for outstanding individual contribution from employees at all levels. So here you have uh, both sides of the coin there. Um, you have all the re human resource functions, but also the imposed obligation that human resources places on the employees um, to be outstanding in their contribution. And in continuation, we have the supply chain management. And that's to collaborate with suppliers to develop innovative products from stable, effective, and efficient sources of supply. You have inventory to achieve low investment in inventory, consistent with high customer service levels and high facility use utilization. You have uh, scheduling to achieve high levels of, uh, th uh, of thorough output, they call throughput, and timely customer delivery through effective scheduling. You also have maintenance to achieve high utilization of facilities and equipment by effective uh, preventive maintenance and prompt repair of facilities and equipment. So each one of these statements corresponds with the functional areas uh, purpose and also to notice that there is an integration that's consistent um, of effectiveness and efficiency throughout. So, with the mission being established, strategy and its implementations can begin. Remember, the strategy is the organization's action plan to achieve the mission. Now, each functional area has a strategy for achieving its mission and helping the organization reach the overall mission. These strategies exploit opportunities and strengths, and they neutralize threats and avoid weaknesses. So, do you um, recognize what we're what we're doing here. So we're essentially performing a SWOT analysis. And a SWOT analysis can help managers identify strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to shape their strategies. So the three strategies for competitive advantage are differentiation, cost leadership, and response. While it may be possible to uh, complete all three at once, most firms focus on one of these major strategies at a time, or just one. Uh, this means operations managers are called on to deliver goods and services and are first, better or at least different, second, they're cheaper, and third, uh, more responsive. So operations managers can translate these strategic concepts and they can generate a system that has a unique advantage over the competitors. Now, differentiation is concerned with providing uniqueness. A uh, firm's opportunities for creating uniqueness are not located with a particular function or activity, but they can arise in a virtually everything the firm does across the continuum of all functions. Uh, moreover, because most products include some service and most services include some products, um, the opportunities for creating this uniqueness are limited only by imagination. So differentiation should be thought of as going beyond both physical characteristics and services uh, attributes to encompass everything about the product or service that influences the value that the cu customers derive from it. So 
in the service sector, one option for extending product differentiation is through an experience um, differentiation by experience. Okay, so differentiation by experience in services is a manifestation of the growing experience economy. So the idea of experience differentiation is to engage the customer. So to use people's uh, five senses so that they become immersed or even an active participant in the product. So Disney uh, does a really good job of this. So Disney does this with the Magic Kingdom. So people no longer just go on a ride. They are immersed in the Magic Kingdom. They're surrounded by dynamic visual and sound experiences uh, that complement the physical ride itself. So you also have themed restaurants such as Hard Rock Cafe. So they differentiate themselves by providing an experience. So Hard, hard Rock uh, engages the customer with classic rock music. Uh, they use big video screens, uh, memorabilia, and staff that tend to tell stories when they're waiting on the customer. Um, the result is a dining experience instead of just a meal. So that is differentiation. Uh, that's what they call experience differentiation. You're using the uh, five senses of the customer. So in all, like I already stated, experience differ differentiation involves engaging a customer with a product through imaginative uh, using the five senses. Uh, so the customer experiences the product. So here, um, you know, we use Disney as, uh, as an example. Movie theaters, they tend to use uh, sight, sound, moving seats, smells, and mists of rain. Uh, restaurants, um, they use music. They tend to have themes. You know, they give you an experience. So Southwest Airlines has been a consistent moneymaker, while other U.S. airlines have lost billions. Southwest has done this by fulfilling a need for low-cost and short-stop flights. Its operation strategy has included use of secondary airports and terminals, first-come, first-served seating, few fare options, uh, smaller crews fly in more hours, um, you know, uh, snacks only uh, instead of meals on the flights, or even no snacks at all on some of the flights, and no uh, down, downtown ticket offices. Now, in addition, Southwest has been very effectively uh, matched. Uh, they have a matched capacity to demand and effectively utilize this capacity. So it has done this by designing a route uh, structure that matches the capacity of its Boeing uh, 737 the only plane in its fleet, so it stays consistent with only one type of fleet, uh, plane in the fleet. So think about how efficient that is on your strategic plan. Uh, second, it achieves more air uh, miles than any other airlines through faster turnarounds. Its planes are on the ground less than any other airline. Um, one driver of a low-cost strategy is a facility that is effectively utilized. So Southwest and others with low-cost strategies understand this and use financial resources effectively. Identifying the uh, how to optimize uh, size allows firms to spread overhead costs, providing a cost advantage. So for example, Walmart continues to pursue its low-cost strategy with superstores that are open 24 hours a day. So for 20 years, it has successfully grabbed market share. So Walmart has driven down uh, store overhead costs, um, shrinkage, and distribution costs. So its rapid um, transportation of goods, reduced warehousing costs, and direct shipment from manufacturers had, had uh, resulted in high inventory uh, turnaround and made it a low-cost leader. So think about what we went over in Chapter 1 and how this corresponds. Sometimes higher productivity has nothing to do with increase in output. It's just less input. So um, Walmart certainly has, uh, you know, uh, epitomized uh, expertise in this area. So likewise, um, Franz uh, Colroy, a Belgian discount food retailer, is also an aggressive cost cutter. 
McElroy cuts, uh, cuts uh, overhead by using converted factory warehouses, movie theaters, and garages as outlets. So customers find no background music when they come into a uh, outlet. There's no shopping bags or uh, bright lights, nothing fancy. All have been eliminated to cut costs. Walmart and Colroyd are winning with a low-cost low strategy. Um, so think about it. Like um, the fancy stores have to increase the cost of their products to cover that overhead where they're able to cut the cost by having no little overhead. So low-cost leadership entails maximum value as defined by your customer, not what you want to offer. It requires examining each of the 10 operation management decisions in a relentless effort to drive down costs while meeting customer expectations of value. Now remember, a low-cost strategy does not imply low value or low quality. It's just, it's just that. It's low cost. So the third strategy um, option is response. Uh, response is often through um, a... Uh, thought of it as a flexible response, but it also refers to uh, reliable and quick response. Okay, so not just flexible, but reliable and quick. Indeed, we uh, define response as including the entire range of values related to timely product development and delivery, as well as re reliable scheduling and flexible performance. So flexible response may be thought of as the ability to match changes in the marketplace where design innovations and volumes fluctuate sustainability. So Hewlett Packard is an exceptional example of a firm that has demonstrated flexibility in both design and volume changes in the volatile world of personal computers. So Hewlett Packard's uh, products often have a life cycle of only months and volume and cost changes during that brief life cycle are dramatic. So, However, Hewlett Packard has also been successful in institutionalizing the ability to change products and volume to respond to dramatic changes in product design and costs, thus building a sustainable competitive edge. You know, if you think about your computers anyway, uh, you know, most of them become obsolete because of mandatory downloads and software um, after only uh, maybe 24 months or so. Before Hewlett Packard used to be under fire because of the products only lasting that long where some of the other, you know, some of the competition was putting more money into the design and the development. Uh, however, the uh, computers would become obsolete anyway for those expensive computers because of mandatory downloads and software. So the uh, second aspect of response is the reliability of scheduling. So one way the German machine and industry has uh, maintained its competitiveness despite having the world's highest labor costs is through reliable response. Now the response manifests itself in a reliable scheduling. So German machine firms have meaningful schedules and they perform to these schedules. Uh, Moreover, the results of these schedules are communicated to the customer, and the customer can, in turn, rely on them. So consequently, the competitive advantage generated through a reliable response has value to the, end, uh, to the end customer. You know what, we're going to go back. I want to talk about the third aspect before we move on. Uh, so the third aspect of uh, response is quickness. Uh, Johnson Electric Holdings, um, with headquarters in Hong Kong, makes 83 million tiny motors each month. The motors go in um, cordless tools, household appliances, and personal care items such as hair dryers. Dozens are found in each automobile. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the supply chain and how it's changed the industries uh, across the boards. Um, in chapter one. So Johnson's major competitive advantage is speed. Speed in product development, speed in production, and speed in delivery. So whether it is a production system at Johnson Electric or a pizza delivery in five minutes by Pizza Hut, the operations manager who develops systems that respond quickly 
have a uh, competitive advantage. So it's important in today's market. So in practice, differentiation, low costs, and response can increase productivity and generate a sustainable competitive advantage. Proper implementation of the 10 decisions by operations managers will allow these advantages to be achieved. And this slide identifies some alternative uh, perspectives that may be helpful prior to establishing and attempting to implement a strategy. So you have a resources view is a uh, method that managers use to evaluate the resources at their disposal at their disposal and manage or alter them to achieve a competitive advantage. Then you have value chain analysis. And this is a way to identify those elements in the production service chain that uniquely add value. And finally, yeah, well, here you have Porter's five forces model. Um, you want to remember this, and it is a method of analyzing the five forces in the competitive environment being immediate rivals, potential entrants, um, customers, suppliers, and substitute products. Now, because the firm operates in a system with many external factors, constant scanning of the environment is required. And finally, strategies need to be dynamic to deal with constant internal and external change. So as you might uh, probably remember from your intro course or courses, a SWOT analysis is a formal review of the internal strengths, weaknesses, and the external opportunities and threats. It represents an excellent model for evaluating a strategy. And this slide in figure 2.6 illustrates the strategy development process in which SWOT analysis plays a key role. Now you're in analyzing the uh, environment where you're identifying the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's usually early on here. Um, you understand the environment, customers, industry, and competitors. Uh, next, you determine the corporate mission, state the reason for the firm's existence. This is going to be the driving force of your strategy and identify the values it wishes to create uh, from a strategy. Then you're going to build a competitive advantage such as a low price design or volume flexibility, quality, quick delivery, uh, dependability, and after sales service, uh, broad uh, and finally broad product lines. Key success factors, um, they are the activities that are necessary for a firm to achieve its goals. It's as simple as that. Uh, once identified, the next step is to group the necessary activities into an organizational structure. And that structure then needs to be satisfied with personnel who get the job done right. The operations function is most likely to be successful when the organization's strategy is integrated with other functional areas of the firm, such as marketing, finance, human resources, information technology, and so forth. And the 10 operations management decisions typically include the key success factors. This slide, figure 2.7, identifies potential key success factors for marketing, finance, and operations. The 10 operations management decisions provide an excellent initial checklist for determining key success factors and identifying core competencies within the operations function. And figure 2.8 from the text illustrates an activity map, uh, which is a graphical link of competitive advantage, key success factors, and supporting activities. So when you have a chance, visit page 44 in the textbook to get a better look at the activity mapping of Southwest Airlines low cost competitive advantage. And as I mentioned earlier, the implementation of the 10 strategic operation management decisions is influenced by a variety of issues from missions and strategy to key success factors and core competencies while addressing such issues as product mix, um, product life cycle, and competitive environment. 
Now, because each product brings its own mix of attributes, the importance and method of implementation of the 10 strategic operation management decisions will vary. So throughout the textbook, we will discuss how these decisions are implemented in ways that provide competitive advantage, how this might be done uh, for two drug companies, one seeking competitive advantage uh, via differentiation and the other via low cost as depicted in this slide here at two, uh, on table 2.1. So here we have um, the low cost uh, strategy to the right and then you have your competitive advantage uh, here. So we have to the left. Um, and just look at the differences. You know, where you have competitive advantage focus, uh, product differentiation uh, strategy, you see uh, heavy investments, uh, you know, extensive labs, focus on development in a broad range of drug categories, as opposed to low investments, focus on development of generic drugs, okay, for low cost. Um, next, you have uh, in respect to quality. So the competitive advantage uh, for product differentiation strategy, you have uh, quality as a major priority. Um, standards exceed regulatory requirements, where on the low cost strategy, it meets regulatory uh, requirements uh, on a country by country basis. Okay, so low cost are just meeting, just, just uh, meeting compliance. You know, and the same goes with process and location. And this is just a continuation of the differences. You can see when it comes down to product differentiation strategy, uh, there's much more of an investment. A fo a focus on exceeding standards, higher quality, as opposed to just meeting in compliance. So this slide introduces the concept of outsourcing, which uh, transfers certain activities to specialty uh, providers, allowing firms to focus on their core competencies. Now, we often assume that outsourcing also always implies that jobs are sent to other countries, but that's not always the case. So processes are often outsourced to domestic suppliers, as uh, occurs when firms use third-party logistics providers. Um, then the concept of outsourcing is not new, but in this slide it illustrates why uh, the use of outsourcing has been increasing in recent years. You have technical expertise, um, reliable in, uh, increase in, uh, ch in cheaper uh, transportation offerings, and uh, rapid development and deployment of advancements in telecommunications and computers are all factors. And this slide describes how the outsourcing of manufacturing represents an extension of the long-standing practice of subcontracting. So when performed on a continuing basis, this becomes contract manufacturing. In addition, these days, uh, you know, like numerous non-core internal service functions such as payroll and legal are being outsourced to specialists. And this slide describes the theory of comparative advantage from economics, which provides the uh, impetus uh, behind the international outsourcing. So if an external provider can perform activities more productively than a purchasing firm, then the external provider should do the work. All right, simple, makes sense. And this slide, table 2.2, identifies potential advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing. Risks can be significant. Roughly half of the all outsourcing uh, agreements fail due to inadequate planning and analysis. And the final disadvantage identified on this slide refers to the phenomenon uh, that many of the risks that firms incur by outsourcing may not show up in profit statements until some time in the future encouraging short-run thinking. So fast-track managers to uh, produce um, 
short run profit increases that they can attribute to their outsourced decisions. So, you know, this is more for the manager who uh, has a mindset where they can see time horizons much further down the line than those immediate profits. Um, because, like I said, the fallout may not really present itself. Um, the negative fallout uh, may not present itself immediately. So the factor rating method uh, can be applied to outsourcing provider selection. Uh, different factors are assigned uh, difference uh, in importance, uh, different important in weights. So a weighted average must be computed. And this slide is based on example one from the book. Uh, in other real applications, managers can add factors and assign different weights as they deem fit. So to keep things simple, all factors should move in the same direction. That is, either low scores are good for all factors or all high scores are good for all factors. I'll leave this up a little for the note takers. And you can revisit your text for this. So operations managers of international and multinational firms approach global opportunities with one of four strategies. Uh, international, uh, multi-domestic, uh, global, and transnational. So the following four slides will provide an illustration of each in the form of an example. And the matrix of figure 2.9 right here has a uh, vertical axis of cost reduction and a horizontal axis of local responsiveness. So local responsiveness implies quick response and or the differentiation necessary for the local market. Now the operations manager must know how to position the firm in this matrix. So for this slide specifically, an international strategy uses exports and licenses to penetrate the uh, global arena. So this strategy is the least advantageous with little local responsiveness and little uh, cost advantage. Uh, but an international strategy is often the easiest as exports can require little change in existing operations and licensing agreements often leave much of the risk to the licensee. And a global strategy has a high degree of centralization with headquarters coordinating the organizations uh, to seek out um, standardization and learning between plants, thus uh, generating economies of scale. Uh, this strategy is appropriate when the strategic focus is cost reduction, but has little to um, recommend uh, when the demand for the local responsiveness is high. Okay, so this is not um, really recommended when the demand for local responsiveness is high. Now, Caterpillar, the world leader in earth moving equipment and Texas instruments, uh, being the world leader in semiconductors, pursue global strategies. So Caterpillar and Texas Instrument find this strategy advantageous because the end products are similar throughout the world. So earth moving equipment is the same in Nigeria as it is here in Iowa. And the multi-domestic strategy has decentralized authority with substantial autonomy at each business. So these are typically subsidiaries, franchises, or joint ventures with substantial independence. And the advantage of this strategy is maximizing a competitive response for the local market. However, the strategy has little or no cost advantage. So many food producers, such as Heinz, use multi-domestic strategy to accommodate local tastes because global integration of the production process is not critical. Um, the concept is consistent with the mindset of 
We are a successful company in the home market. Let's export the management talent and processes, not necessarily the product, to accommodate another market. Any transnational st strategy exploits the economies of scale and learning, as well as pressure for the responsiveness uh, by recognizing that core competence does not reside in the just the uh, home country by in you know by it can exist anywhere it can exist anywhere in the organization um, transnational describes a uh, condition in which material people and ideas cross or tr uh, transgress uh, national boundaries so these firms have the potential to pursue all three operation strategies such firms can be uh, thought of as world company whose country identity is not as important as their independent network of worldwide operations. And you have Nestle is probably a best example of, of such a company. Although it is legally a Swiss company, 95% uh, of its assets are held and 98% of its sales are made outside Switzerland. Fewer than 10% of its workers are Swiss. So this concludes the chapter two lecture. Be sure to complete all the expectations and deliverables associated with this chapter, and I will see you in chapter three.